On to our next question. Uh, I don't know if this is a term that you like or not, but it is out there called the Malaska move. And, and uh, basically he's talking about this feeling. Yeah. How does he know, how do you, he, Jordan wants to know, how does a player know when they've overdone the Malaska move? Well, Bobby Jones famously said anything good in golf can be overdone. Overdone, yeah. Okay, so, so if you start watching the path of the club into the ball, you can tell by path. Like tell, on video? Yeah. yeah. If all of a sudden the club is actually getting out here and it's going this way, you've overdone it. So it's a feeling of this, but it's not actually the, no, no. the hands, the no. club tipping out there. No, it's, you've got a weight. So this, this club is, is a mass and it's force. So you have a weight out there and it's swinging in a circle. And when you change directions, the weight of that club wants to go this way, which is, which is great. That helps hold your right shoulder back, it holds your hip back. But if you just let it keep going, all of a sudden it, that weight falls behind you too far and it drives your hands out away from you. So to offset that, you have to feel like when you start down that the handle's coming down, the club's going out. It would be it like what, what you see Sergio doing. Sergio is a big example of what it's like to make the handle come down and the club head go out. But so many people I've heard use Sergio as an example of why they should do this. Yeah, but see, he's not doing so, that. So when you look at Sergio's swing, you're seeing something different oh, than a lot of other instructors. So show me what you're seeing. If you watch Sergio's club head, yeah. he goes up to the top, and when he starts down, the club head goes this way just a little bit, goes just like that. Yeah. And then the club head basically stops going down and it goes back up and it goes yeah. out this way. Hands are going down and the yeah. club head all of a sudden goes this way out in front of him. Because if his hands and the club head kept going to right there, there's no chance we'd ever hurt a Sergio because the club would be so far behind him. Yeah. He doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. If you watch his club, it stops and goes back up and it works this way. So the handle's coming down and he's working the club back out in front. I've stood behind him on the range and watched him for hours. Never in a million years would I thought I would have come out here and, and had you say Sergio was an example of the Malaska move. Yeah, he is. Sergio, when, when he takes the club, and Sergio's talked about his hands go down. Yeah, his dad used to tell him he's pulling on a chain. Down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So his hands go down in the club. His hands don't go forward. No. Okay, well... You got to be careful when you start saying shallow the shaft. If you shallow the shaft and your hands go forward and you do it, you're done. See, he doesn't do that. He gets up here and he starts down. He gets up to the top and he starts down and the club goes this way just a little bit. And then all of a sudden his hands go faster than the club head and the club head reroutes itself back out in front of his hands. Bam! And he catches the face up. Mm -hmm. So if I do that, that's how I start generating more and more speed, is how I use my body and how I use this pivot to accelerate the club, rather than dragging it this way and trying to hold this off and square it with my body. It's just a different way to create speed. You always say the term catching the face up. Where, where do you, in your mind, where, where, where is that, what's that coming from? Well, any time the club and the club head starts to go this way and the face wants to work that way, uh -huh. at some point in time, you're gonna to have to do something to square and catch the face back up to square. Right. The longer if it always stays behind you, then it's just yeah. Well, you've got to have a lot of this or a lot of body rotation to square the face. Okay. Now, if you're really flexible and you want to put a lot of stress in your lower back, which will tend to happen more than you need, then you can go here and you can try to twist as hard as you want to try to get the club face back to square. I'd rather not put any unnecessary force in my body that I don't need relative to creating speed. Okay. I can still hit it plenty far, so can anybody. There's multiple ways for the body to generate speed and force. There's not just one. Yeah. So when, when people start doing swing methods, okay, fine. Everybody's got their ideas. Try it. Now, I mean, I tell people, I even tell my instructors, you hear somebody teaching, see what they do, go out and try it. See what it does for you. See, if you automatically go, this is really good, it's yeah. making me significantly better player, okay, maybe it might be something we wanna look into. If it's not, don't stand there for six months thinking at some point in time this is gonna work. It probably won't. Right. If it doesn't immediately start to make sense to you or physically you start making more solid impact where you see some drastic improvement, I wouldn't think about spending the next six months to a year trying to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, we only get 100 years. <laughs> so, so we don't wanna waste one of them or half of, half of one of them um, going down a rabbit hole. My question to you. Yeah, right. 
And I used to ask this, uh, I'm trying to think, Peter Kessler on the golf channel. Yeah, Peter, yeah, yeah. One of the best interviewers I've ever been around. I used to ask him, I said, Peter, when you actually go out to hit balls, because he would have two or three instructors a week that were notable instructors. Yeah. And a lot of times, totally different ideas, totally different methods, totally different grips, different setups, different mm -hmm. balls. I said, so when you go out to hit a ball, because you still want to play, how's your mind doing? Yeah. So, Brendan, yeah, how's, my how's mind your doing? mind? <laughs> You know, at, at first it, it was pretty much, it's like a crowded restaurant, you know, or like imagine if you go to the, to the lake and there's a lot of geese there and they're all making a lot of noise. That's kind of what it felt like at first. But now I really have a, if you've seen that, unlike maybe what Peter was doing, uh, on my channel, I really focus on a certain type of instructor. Basically, I focus on people who have more upper body or hands oriented uh, tasks to do things right. to do so uh people like monty and um tony and you right. and bobby lopez and a lot of people so they're all really similar in that regard so everything to me i can kind of see the through line when you say certain things it seems like the same thing just a different idea of how to do okay. it so personally for me what i'm just trying to do is i'm trying to be at the top and i'm just trying to throw really and I actually threw my arm out last week trying to do that so hard. <laughs> I actually did this so hard that I felt exactly like when I used to pitch yeah. and threw my arm out. So, so as we said, anything can be overdone. But, oh, that's, that's yeah. for sure. Well, so then you've kind of, what you've done then, based on your experience with all these people and what you've seen in a golf swing, you've kind of said, okay, there's a few things that I really feel comfortable with that I seem to see helping people and there's ways to get that across yeah. different mm -hmm. ways yeah which is awesome because what i did when i first started when i got really bad yeah. i quit taking lessons and i started reading everything that was out there starting Just in the 18th. shut off all voices shut everywhere. off voices yeah. i read 1800s i about every 10 20 years whoever was the best instructor i read the book i made a list uh what was their philosophy of the game grip ball position aim uh backswing change of directions impact follow through and I wrote down what they believed in those areas. And then I went to the next book, and I went to the next book, and then I went commonalities. So was there anything common in what these guys believed in what the game was? How about grip? How about ball position? And so when I came up through into the 90s at the time, now I had about 30 books over the whole entire time of golf that had been taught, that had been written. And I had all these, these different books categorized, and I had the common things that they kind of all believed in. Yeah. And I started teaching and researching those common things and how to make them work. And it even started making me better. Yeah. Because nobody really taught all the common things. Everybody had a little twist mm -hmm. so they could make it their own. Yeah. Which is fine. I mean, that's marketing. I mean, you have different cell phones, you have different whatever. I mean, they're all pretty much the same, but you got right. to have a, to make money and market mm -hmm. yourself. So when I started to see that, and then I started to understand the physiology and the physics behind those common things, my students started to get significantly better with a lot less effort, a lot less pressure on them. And I'm going, huh. Plus it started to explain what I had as a kid, yeah. why I was so good so quick. Mm -hmm. There's information out there that says that almost everybody, once they start golf, after two and a half years of playing it fairly seriously, that's about 90% as good as they're ever gonna get. Yeah, that's the statistic that started Be Better Golf, because all of our viewers are basically plateaued golfers. Right. Well, most everybody is. Yeah. Okay, so why are they plateaued would be the question. Well, see, I would say that's correct if, if the things that you're working on require a tremendous amount of hand-eye coordination and a lot of practice to duplicate them under pressure. Yeah. If those things don't and they, they play into other, other things that you do and they're not that hard to duplicate, hitting the ball should be not that hard to be pretty good at. Now, playing the game is different than just hitting the golf ball. Okay, that's why golf is such a magical game. It's because to learn how to hit the ball, golf ball fairly solid, get it in front of you, and be pretty good at I don't think is that difficult. Mm -hmm. But then you take uneven lies, the wind, your emotions, the, you know, this and that and the other. There's so many variables in golf that don't happen in other sports that make consistently scoring more difficult because you have to learn how to make adjustments that a lot of other t sports don't necessarily have to do. And you're the whole team. You have, to, you have to play your foul balls. You're the pitcher, the catcher, the first, second, third baseman, outfielder, you're the whole field. And if you have a weakness in your game, it gets exposed because you're the one that's doing it. 
That's why I think golf is different. Not because the swing is harder, hitting a ball is fairly solid. That should not be that hard to do. Mm -hmm. We should be able to get people fairly competent at hitting the ball. Then the, the, the quest, it becomes the art form of teaching them how to play the game. And that's what we should be focused more on. How do you play golf with what you have? Give them something they understand that they can practice and get better at. Then let's start playing golf, not just standing on the range trying to find a magical swing that's going to work because there isn't one out there. Not even the Malaska move? No. No, no. No. All right, guys, we'll be back with more. You guys can see more about Mike Malaska on his YouTube channel, Malaska Golf. Just search that and you'll see it also linked here. And be sure to subscribe to this as well. For see sure. Later.